Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome and aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov, and I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today our program is titled In the Vineyard, and uh, you'll be seeing, you'll be seeing uh, very soon some, some wines, but uh, my guest is Seth Buckley. Seth is an attorney with the Hawaii law firm of Chang Iwamasa. Uh, Seth has traveled and studied across the sea in the Asia Pacific region and now he lives and works in Hawaii uh, but he also has worked for law firms in Australia and China. He has a lot of interests. Some of them involve photojournalism, boon and wine and he has a blog titled Musing, Musings by the Glass which you can find if you just go online and type in www.musingsbytheglass.com. Uh, today, Seth and I will walk through his vineyard and discuss his relationships with law, photography, wine, and life, and how they are all related to each other. So good morning, Seth. It's good to see you. Good morning, Mark. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. My, my pleasure. Uh, first, I want to learn a little bit about you. Yeah, of course. Okay. You're a lawyer I, in Hawaii. I'm a lawyer. Okay, what, yes. what, what type of law do you do? What, what, what is your practice? And then we're going to go into sure. wine and sure. food the and more photography. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So my firm, Chang Yu Omasa, specializes in um, real estate development, real estate finance, uh, some bond financing, and general corporate matters. So where do I fall into yeah, that? What, what do you do? Uh, I, I like to focus on business law, um, small businesses in particular, corporate law, corporate matters, and finance. And then some nonprofit organizations. Okay. All right. And you, you like the, you like those areas. And yeah. Okay. I, I notice also that uh, you traveled a little bit. Uh, you're, you're you're not from Hawaii. You're from Boston, right? I'm, uh, I'm from Boston originally. Okay. Yeah. Born and raised, and I was there uh, essentially in in the Northeast through college, okay. through undergraduate. Then you got to Hawaii, and things changed, right? I mean, you 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 kind of got into the Asia Pacific. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Sure, sure. So in uh, Boston, I didn't have a lot of exposure to the Asia Pacific or its culture and history. Um, so coming out to Hawaii originally was for my MBA and then subsequently my, my law degree. And uh, it was all a very new experience for me. Um, and when I came here, I really being wanted... Being in Hawaii and the, the Asia Pacific culture. Being in culture. Hawaii, being in this type of culture, it's, it's very, very different from Boston, uh, the New England area. So it was all um, a, a new and exciting experience for me. And I really wanted to dive in, um, you know, just get out there and experience as much as I possibly could. So uh, when I came out here, I just fell in love with the, with the history, with the culture, with probably most importantly the food. I just absolutely love the food out here and in, in this region. Um, and that was the starting point for me. And, 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 and it was your first taste, if you will. It was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, my, my first taste of, of the culture and cuisine, yeah. Okay. And, and so what, what you, you liked the Asia Pacific area, you liked the food, the culture, and what did, what did that lead you to do? And, and you, were, you were going to school. Yes. Okay. So I, I started my MBA program and then moved into a JD program. And um, I, I knew pretty quickly that um, Hawaii was great. The culture and history here is really great. Um, but I wanted to move beyond that and explore even more. Um, so I used my education as um, kind of a platform to be able to travel abroad. Uh, student budgets are not always uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> very large. So I just dug around and did my own research and found some grants and fellowships that uh, were able to pay in a large part for my travels to uh, Melbourne, Australia, to Hong Kong, and then over to Shanghai. Okay, now, uh, I just want to ask you a little bit about the, the grants. Yeah. Uh, you, were you a law student at the time? Or at the what, time what? for the grants and fellowships, I was a law student. At, at the UH Law School? At, at UH Richardson School of Law. Okay. And the, uh, the UH system has grants and fellowships for graduate programs. And uh, I, I went to them and I asked, hey, you know, you say graduate programs, but you're not specific. Does it uh, apply to law as well? Because the law school is kind of separate from a lot of the other right. programs. And they said, well, we've never been asked that question before, but we'll look into it and you can write your application and specify why law relates to um, the fellowship programs that they have. And so I did and uh, I was accepted. So that's a good hint for young, young law students. Yeah. If, if, they're, if they have an interest in 
a grant or traveling or going somewhere else, uh, while there's still a law, a law student, perhaps there's an opportunity there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think, you know, coming out of undergraduate, I had student loans, and I, I restricted mm. myself in a lot of ways at right. first. Uh, through my MBA program, I said, I just don't have the money to do this. It's really interesting, fascinating to me, but I just can't. I just can't. And in law school, I dropped that mentality and said, why not? You know, and, and that's when I really started researching grants and fellowships um, and finding that there's a lot out there mm. um, for students. And, and if you just dig around and do your due diligence, um, you can come up with some programs that will essentially pay for your travels and get you out and exposed to those things. Wow. So yeah. you, you went to Australia, yes. Hong Kong, and China, yes. so Shanghai. Uh, what were those experiences like? Yeah, well, well Melbourne, Australia, I was doing uh, studies, of course. I was studying at La Trobe University. They have um, an LLM program that's focused on business, international business and finance, um, as it relates to law, of course. And the University of Hawaii system, their law program, doesn't have a lot of international mm. business and international finance uh, classes. They have some, um, but they don't specialize in that. So uh, going to La Trobe University in Melbourne was uh, my way of being able to expand on my own personal interests um, that I couldn't necessarily get while staying here. Which were which international? Were international business, comparative business law, finance, international finance. Mm -hmm. um, they had a lot of those programs that, um, that I was able to utilize. Okay, and, yeah. and Hong Kong, what, what was your experience? So Hong Kong was similar. Um, through a fellowship program with the university, I was able to go to Hong Kong and study there for a semester. And uh, that university, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, also has a program that specializes in um, comparative corporate law, international finance, world trade law, wow. some, some of the programs that, uh, and classes that I couldn't get if I stayed local. Okay, and then ultimately, Shanghai. Yeah. Uh, how'd, how'd you get there? So Shanghai, again, that's just, you know, when you do your due diligence and you get out there and you talk to people, you come up with these relationships that you never know when they're mm. gonna pay off. Contacts. You know, contacts, relationships, you never know who's gonna call you, when, and what they're gonna have for you. And while I was in Hong Kong, um, well, before I was in Hong Kong, I was, of course, trying to talk to anyone who had Asia Pacific experience, who might know of fellowships and grants that I could apply for, um, or just had information that I thought would help me to get to those places. And one of those contacts um, called me up and said, hey, I know you're in Hong Kong. Uh, I don't know what you're doing in the summertime, but a friend of mine has um, a law firm in Shanghai, and they're looking for uh, a summer associate. And if you're interested, go ahead and apply. Wow. So I, I did on their recommendation. Um, I interviewed and got that position in China. And, and you were still were you still in law school at that time? Or, yes, yeah? it was it was during the summer, so, so I so didn't miss class. Great experience. Then. Absolutely. I, I, and and you you enjoyed your times there in, in the yes. Asia. Oh yes, absolutely. Now, as as a Boston boy, had you ever been? In, I had not. You hadn't yeah. been to Australia or, or no. Hong Kong or China. This is all no. first time. All first time. Wow. All first time. All my friends thought I was crazy. <laughs> and 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 you you just found these opportunities. So yeah. That's great. That's yeah. great. And and the whole experience uh, working uh, for law firms in those areas was was good, positive, and you made good contacts. And yeah. How'd that work out? Yeah. Oh, I still have contacts there. We still um, chat back and forth. We refer business back and forth. Melbourne um, is a, a fairly similar practice to what you might find in the United States. Um, in Shanghai and China, it's a little different. You mm. have to be a little bit more practical. Um, the clients, we were dealing with foreign clients that had business interests in China. So either they had a greenfield investment physically located in China or they're dealing with manufacturers. Okay, explain what greenfield means. So greenfield investment is essentially when someone, a foreign investor, makes investments and they actually break ground in in another location, so, so they're physically present there. Um, whereas, you know, with the manufacturing, you basically have a relationship with a Chinese manufacturer that manufactures and ships your products. So there's there's a difference for the client in mm -hmm. how they need to approach those two. And those they, two they really need advice, too. And they really need advice, and, and I was surprised. <laughs> I dealt primarily with um, European clients, uh, some US clients, and a lot of clients from Australia. And I was really surprised the sophisticate or the spectrum of sophistication of mm -hmm. these clients. Some were highly sophisticated, and they knew what they were doing in China. They had a lot of experience. They were there for a long time, and we didn't have to hold their hand as much. With some of these new clients that just saw China broadly as you know a way to um, invest and make money, like that was almost the, their simple mind mindset mm -hmm. for moving mm -hmm. into China. 
And they really needed uh, not just legal advice, which of course was important, but um, business advice, practical advice, how to deal with the government, how to deal with you know, a system that isn't always, um, it, there's some corruption involved, <laughs> let's, let's put it that way. It's different. And yeah, it's yeah. different. And how do you, as a foreign company, uh, interact with that, with that system. So they needed a, a bit of practical advice uh, on how to deal with people and yeah. what would be normal in China and everybody knows about, they had no idea. They had no idea and a lot of times they were taken advantage of, especially with, for example, intellectual property. Mm -hmm. um, the system is different in China than it is here. And so a lot of US clients would go over to China thinking the system's the same, it's not. And these Chinese companies were able to basically grab intellectual property from these companies before they registered in China. So that's why they, they that's why they need count that's why they need lawyers. That's why they need lawyers. Who and, know who knows something about what's going on. Absolutely. And, and in the United States we're very careful to narrow our scope to tell clients we don't give business advice, we don't give, you know, governmental advice. Um, you know, we're lawyers, we stick to the law. In China that doesn't really work very well because these clients really need a, a broader spectrum of, of counsel and advice. And that's often what they'll get. Now, just in general, as to that part of your, your life, and you still have friends there, and how, how did you yeah. find, find the people in Australia and China on the one-to-one the -one type basis? Well, well, it's interesting, a couple of different ways. First, when um, I was still preparing to travel to these locations, so before I was there, um, I was just emailing as many people as I could find online, friends of mine that had friends, that had a cousin, that had a friend. <laughs> um, any contact I could possibly try to manufacture while I was here, I knew would help me when, once I was on the ground. Because I literally knew zero people mm. in all of those locations. So I didn't want to have myself in a position where I would step off the plane and really not have any person's contact. So I did a lot of research ahead of time. and. Um, some people thought, you know, who is this guy emailing me? Um, but for the most part, uh, a lot of the early relationships I had were, were through those, those emails and those phone calls. And then when I was there, I was able to um, get on the ground and really start to do my own networking on the ground. And I'm an introvert by nature, so that was a little difficult for me, but it was something to just, I had to get out of my box and I had to push myself to do that. Okay, well let, let's get out of your box right now and talk yeah. about your, your blog. You have sure. a really interesting photo, journalism, wine blog, <laughs> Musings by the Glass. Yeah. Uh, what, what's that about? And, and I, 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 th I think that kind of ties into what you were just talking about in a way. It's, but t tell us, what, how did you get started in the blogging and choosing those topics? And sure. How did you get into it? Sure, so the blog started originally as um, a passion of photography. Uh, when I was traveling, I loved to have my camera with me wherever I went. And in particular, a, a photojournalistic style. I was always trying to capture a story. I love how photography can evoke an emotional response from an image or a dialogue just based off of an image. I love how photography can provide a social commentary. Um, whether that commentary is positive or negative, I think both are important. Um, but that was my framework. Um, when I was in Asia was just taking pictures and trying to capture a narrative um, wherever I was. And for the blog, uh, it started as that. But when I came back, I realized I'm not going to be in those situations as much here. I'm going to be settling into a, a position. I'm not going to be traveling as much. And I want to be able to do something locally. Um, so I, I took the concept of the photography and being able to have a narrative. And in the blog context, you can still have your photography that's important. But you can also write and expand on that narrative, which I, I found um, fascinating. I really wanted to try that. And, and when you, what you've done is you've talked about food and wine. And we're going to take a break. And when we come back, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit more about food and wine and Great. also to show us some, some of your photos. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together, working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Hi, I'm Pete McGinnis-Mark, 
And every Monday at one o'clock, I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university, ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me, one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And see you then. All right, we are back with Seth Buckley, and we are walking through his vineyard. And we are going to take a little look right now at some of his photos uh, from his blog and hear a little bit about each, each one. Uh, and, and he kind of, uh, Seth, you, you, you kind of break it up into, into kind of two areas. Uh, I mean, yeah. there, there is a kind of a food and wine area, and then there's, there's a, a social area, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. for, for your, your, your photos. Yeah. And then you, 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 then you have a separate section on wines, which you, yeah. you brought a few for us to talk about. But, okay, so let's first talk about the uh, first couple of photos sure. and see if you could tell me a little bit about what they are, what your feelings were, and where, where, where you came up. So the, yeah. so the first photo is, looks like a, a wine... Be, or, or is it sake? Yeah, or what the, is the, the first photo is um, a, a sake um, that's being poured into a glass. And it's a simple concept. It's sake being poured. Um, hmm. But the point of this is to really capture a mood. Yeah. Um, and with food photography and wine photography, the whole point is to make uh, the, the viewer kind of call them to action. You know, you want them to, to be salivating. You want them to be thirsty. You want them to be hungry. You want them to want to go out and have that experience. Um, and that's what I'm trying to capture in, in this image. And I liked how the light hits uh, the, the bottle and the glass with the green in the background that's kind of bokeh out. It kind of gives you a sense of, of calm and serenity. You want to be in this situation where you're just relaxed and enjoying the glass and there's no worries in the world kind of concept. Hmm. Um, and with food photography, I'm always looking to set a mood. Um, where, where was this taken? This was taken at a friend's house. He has oh. a, a backyard that has a wow. little um, koi pond with some greenery. So I had to kind of set up the shot a little bit with the, with the Japanese elements, but um, it, the, the, the spot really sold itself, mm. which mm. is why I chose it. Okay, let's take a look at the next, sure. next slide. Yeah, what's that? So, you know, with food photography, as I mentioned, um, you, you want the food to look delicious. You want to have the person be thirsty and want to grab that beverage that you're pouring. But there's also a story behind food um, and wine. And a lot of my photography, you know, again, being journalistic in nature, I'm trying to capture the narrative of the food and wine itself. So in this picture, you have this master chef that was at an event I was shooting, and you just see his careful preparation. Mm. Even in an event where he had to, to make hundreds of these. I mean, <laughs> there, there, it was an event with several hundred people, um, he, he was just trying to keep pace with the people pulling them off the table. But he's being an artist here. But he's being an artist, you know, and you can see his, you can't see his eyes, but you can see his face. You can see that there's, there's focus there, you know, and there's focus in his hands. He's got tweezers that he's holding um, to kind of position the elements of the dish. And I love the stories that you can find um, in food. And, and, and if you looked at that table just at the event, you might just see, oh, hey, there's some food. I'm going to eat it. But you know, look a little bit closer and you see, you see the detail being put into it. This goes beyond, this goes to the preparation, and this goes to the intent, and this goes to the love of the person doing it. Yes, precisely. Actually, yeah, precisely. you can see, you can feel that. Okay, yeah. so th this, is, this is a different type, Seth, a different type of um, photo th that you have here. Um, then then your, your, your other photos, tell us about those. Those are more of a social, social aspect. Yeah, so I, I think on a couple of levels, I, I love um, photojournalism and street photography because, you know, there are stories on every corner. Everywhere you go, there's a story in the alleyway, in the street vendor that's selling his food, in the, the farmer's markets where the, the farmers are selling their vegetables. Um, there are stories all around us. And most of the time, we fail to even notice them. And, uh, you know, we're, we're busy. We're trying to get from one place to another, and we don't really observe the world around us. And are, are you going around with, with your camera? I mean, is, is this, yeah. it's in your hand, so you're, you're thinking, 
yeah. to look and see something and boom. Yeah, so photography for me is a way to slow down and observe the world around me and engage the world around me. And see something. And, I, and, I, and see I, something I, different I, in you. Maybe unique. that's, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of get that from what you're saying. Yeah, and so a lot of my photography and the ones we'll see coming up, I don't want to manipulate the environment. I want to see what's in the environment capture it and tell that narrative. Okay, well, let's take a look at your, your sure. next photo. Tell us a little bit what this, what, what is this? Yeah, so this was in um, Taiwan. Beautiful. I was traveling in Taiwan with my wife and we had the opportunity to go to Hualien, which is uh, on the eastern side. It's, it's a place that not many tourists go. And there are certain places that are restricted because there's a large in, indigenous population there. And we had a friend who's a, a university professor in that area and she uh, does a lot of research on the various indigenous groups in the area. And so she invited us, knowing that we were going to be in Taiwan, um, to come over and do some field research with her, which was really, really exciting for me as a, as a photojournalist. And uh, this was captured, it's an older woman, and she's teaching the, the group that's there, it's a small group, um, the, the art of the tuku weave. She's, <laughs> uh, she's a tuku, uh, that's her, her, um, her tribe. And it's it's very elaborate, and it was used <laughs> at first um, for women to get husbands. Uh, that's kind of how they started with their weave. Of course, they need it for clothing and other things, but um, it, was, it, it was used primarily as a way for, for women to show their worth to husbands, that in cooking. Um, but she, she, you know, she's in her 90s, <laughs> and yet she's still so passionate about right. this weave. She's still doing it every day. It takes a tremendously long time to do, to create garments and to create blankets. Um, but I just love the care that she has and the smile on her face. She's really, really enjoying it. The intensity. Yeah. All right, let, let's take a look at the next, next photo. All right. so, so this I, I took in Cambodia. Um, my wife and I uh, invest in uh, an NGO or, or donate to an NGO that does some work in Cambodia. And um, we're both very interested in social justice um, and equality and trying to use our financial resources in a way that... Um, that helps others. And Cambodia is one of the projects that we are invested in. And we don't want to just give money. We want to actually go and, and be a part of it and, and observe it and do whatever we can while we're there to, to help the project. So this was a, a project um, at a, a school in a, a very rural part of Cambodia. And the, the program built this school along with some other community structures and uh, provided teaching. They provided clean water. And they were teaching the kids the, the primary thing that they wanted to teach kids was um, cleanliness, washing your hands. I mean, it's things yeah. that we take kind of for granted these days. Yeah. And I just love the picture of this, this girl. She's, you know, she has this look going away from the camera. She's intrigued by something. She has this beautiful, colorful dress that's um, kind of contrasted to the, to the colorful, but, but you know, dirty circumstances <laughs> behind her with the school. Um, but despite that circumstance, she was just this vibrant, beautiful little girl. And, um, and you can almost feel her thinking. Yeah, you can. I mean, you don't know what she's looking at or what she's thinking about, but she's definitely very focused on it. Yeah. 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 Okay, I'm, I'm going to skip to the wines sure. uh, uh, and talk a little bit about them so that we can get them within our t time yeah, frame here. So absolutely. You, you, you brought some wines. I brought some wines. Please, please, of course, uh, the wine blog. Yeah, you're a wine yeah. blogger but, and a photography blogger, <laughs> and, and uh, there's a lot that you have. Tell us a little bit about what you brought and what, sure. what their significance are. Yeah, you know, it's, it's always hard to recommend wines when people say, well, tell me a wine I should buy, because it matters a lot on that person's uh, taste, their palate. It matters what they're going to be doing with the wine, how they're going to be enjoying it, um, what they're going to be eating with it. There's a lot of factors. Um, but for this, this show, I, I thought, you know, hey, uh, we're talking about the Asia Pacific. Let's showcase oh, okay. some idea. wines here. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of people, when they think of wine, they think of Europe. They think of France, Italy, right. Spain, Germany, which have tremendous wine regions. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people kind of look over the Asia Pacific region. And I think that's a mistake. Uh, in, in Hawaii, in the United States, I think we're, we're more prone to look to California, which I definitely consider an Asia Pacific um, appellation. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, so we, we do have some familiarity with, with Napa. Um, but I think the region as a whole is very exciting. So the, the first wine I brought uh, closest to you is, sure. is actually a sake. Um, okay. It's called Wandering Poet. It's named mm. after a, a, an old famous Chinese poet, Li Po. Huh. Um, who, yeah, uh, was, po. Was, he was famous for drinking sake and writing poems, <laughs> which I guess that's not a bad life if you get famous for that. 
Um, and he, the legend has it that he died um, by drowning because he was in a small boat by himself, drinking sake and howling at the moon. <laughs> Uh, so I guess the moral of the story is <laughs> don't, don't do that. <laughs> um, but but I, I just wanted to highlight sake because it's a beverage that a lot of people don't really understand. Um, the, the labeling can be quite confusing to the Western audience, um, but it's a delightful, delightful drink. And there's a lot of sophistication in it. There's a lot of elegance in it. And on my blog, I have a couple of posts that help people to select, select and discern the labels and kind of know what they're looking for. But I think if you live in this region and you don't have... Um, Sake, you're not exposing yourself to that. It's 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 really too bad. Okay. Let's, what do we what do we have here? The, the second wine is um, from Napa, so it's a region that a lot of people know, Napa Valley. Um, but I chose this to highlight one thing. And um, in Napa Valley, it's a valley, but it's surrounded by two mountain ranges. And as so, when it started as a region, most people were on the valley floor. And since then, people have discovered going up in elevation up these mountain ranges. And when you go up in elevation, you do a couple of things. You get above the cloud cover, so you have some beautiful morning sunshine. You get Pacific breezes that you don't get on the valley floor because they're blocked by the, by the mountain ranges. Um, and you get a very complex terroir. The, the gravel rocks, the soils are different from the valley floor. So uh, to me, you get a really, really beautifully structured, opulent, elegant wine hmm. um, when you go up into Mountain. And, and so, what is this one called? So this particular is an O'Shaughnessy. It's a Cabernet Sauvignon, and it's from hmm. Howell Mountain, which is my favorite mountain in the region. Okay. Yeah. And what, what is this? What the is third this? and the fourth both highlight value wines. I, I want to oh, okay. give something for everyone. So right, I, I'll, I'll jump back and say the, the Wandering Poet, um, the sake you can find for about $30 at Fujioka's Wine Time. Hmm. Um, the O'Shaughnessy... Um, Howell Mountain, generally, where this wine is from, you're looking at the hundred dollar range. So okay. it's it's a it's a little bit more expensive, but you know if you have a really good event you want to impress, um, that's a good wine for it. Or if you really want to howl at the moon. Or if you really really want to howl at the moon, yeah. <laughs> um, the the last two are uh, under twenty. Wow. So these okay. are more for the you know bargain wine for the weekday table kind of thing, um, and they come from Australia and New Zealand. So the first is from New Zealand. It's a uh, Mount Beautiful Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is a grape that's well-traveled. Um, it's, it's all over, but it's a very, very finicky grape. It's hard to do well. Um, and a lot of people try, and a lot of people fail. And it's also a wine that's not usually cheap. In France, Burgundy is famous for Pinot Noir. That's, that's where it's from. But those wines can go easily over $100. They can go up. They're some of the most expensive wines in the world. So, you know, it, there's, there's a price point there. Mm. California, Sonoma Valley, Oregon, they, they do very well with Pinot Noir, but they're again $50 to $70 for a good bottle. Um, these locations in New Zealand, this bottle is about $19.99 at, uh, at Tamora's, so you can find a, a good value, uh, much cheaper, and it's, they're tremendous. The New Zealand is, and Australia are both really doing amazing things with wine right now. Um, they were known at first for being uh, exporting kind of cheap wines, and not very elegant and sophisticated, but they're changing um, that perception really quickly. So the, the, the Pinot Noir from uh, New Zealand is fantastic. Um, Pinot Noir generally from New Zealand is really, really good. And then Australia, a lot of people think of Australia was Shiraz. That's kind of, that, that's where they got their start exporting. Mm. And they exported, they, they, they were growing and creating wine specifically for export and specifically to the United States. And that's where they got their reputation for kind of cheaper, not very good wine. Uh, but since then, they've really put an emphasis on quality. And um, this wine from Margaret River is one of my favorite regions. It's on the far west side on, by the ocean. It's a very small uh, region. It kind of reminds me of like Denver. You know Denver for mm -hmm. craft yeah, beer yeah, yeah, yeah. and all of the exciting things right, they're doing right. for craft beer there. That's what Margaret River is for Australian wine, I think. And this is a, a Riesling, um, which I chose also because uh, the perception on Riesling is often it's kind of a sweet wine. Um, it's a sweet white wine and, and you know some people don't really like it because they don't like sweet wines they want dry wines mm, mm. this is a, a very dry crisp wine um, lots of minerality great fruit and it just shows um, the spectrum that you can get with recently okay well th those are that's good advice for us uh, from a lawyer <laughs> and uh, it shows that there's more to law and life than just the practice yeah. uh, and if they go onto your web, um, onto your blog, they can find out yeah. about this. If, if folks want to find out more about 
online and see more of your photos. And yeah, absolutely. Make it, make absolutely. On, on yeah. to your musings <laughs> by the glass. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I, and I have um, uh, food pairing suggestions for local food because I think it's really important to pair wine with local food. I think it's brilliant. Mm. Um, so I have recommendations for that. I have recommendations for wine. Um, and then some of that photojournalism as well. well. Well, Seth, look, thank you very much for showing us this aspect of, of law across the sea. And I appreciate having you here. Thank, thank you, you very it's much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks.